And we're back with another episode of On the Record with Tiffany. And uh, here on, on 9.30 a.m., The Answer, uh, we try to bring guests that are from every walk of life and from every political perspective so that we can show how, that we're more alike than we are different and that we have some wonderful politicians out there that are working on our behalf to do the best for the constituents of the state of Texas, regardless of who they voted for or what uh, their persuasions are. And one of those wonderful politicians is with me today. Um, Representative Aaron Sweener is a 35-year-old Democratic member of the Texas House of Representatives for District 45. And she just, uh, she's a pretty new member of, to the House, right? You've, you've only been there since 2019. This is my second session. Wow, lady, you really took on a big, big issue. <laughs> Uh, I've been joking that anybody else would look at this legislation and know that a sophomore member shouldn't carry it. But <laughs> hey, a sophomore member carried it great. It. <laughs> uh, so, I, okay, I do have to like point out this little fact. When when I was sitting there looking at you, I was like, she looks so familiar. And my husband like walks through the room and goes. That's that kid from Jeopardy. <laughs> That's said, impressive. He picked me out from 2012. I'm like, oh my, God. I was like, no, she's not. And so then we go back and look and, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't believe he remembers people who were on Jeopardy in 2012. That he is impressive. He should go on Jeopardy if he has that kind of memory. He remembers all kinds of stuff like that, I, that I do like not remember. Jeopardy. And I was just like, you do not know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, I'm I'm going to recruit your husband to try and get on the show if he remembers stuff like that. <laughs> uh, he knows a lot of facts. I don't know how, how useful they are, but he knows a lot of <laughs> That sounds like the perfect Jeopardy contestant. <laughs> <laughs> he probably is. <laughs> um, but I, I want to talk to you about House Bill 2020, 20, uh 2275, it was such a monumental bill for, for us, for kidney patients. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about what inspired you to do, to come up with this bill? Yeah, um, this legislation, you know, initially came out of my interest in making sure our um, electric grid is modernized uh, and resilient. Um, I like to joke with folks that I cared about the electrical grid before it was cool or, or uh, <laughs> ice cold as it was. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, so I, I've really been interested in questions of modernizing our grid for a while. And then, of course, all of those issues got a much finer point put on them by the blackout that we all experienced around the state um, where we had half of Texans with water interruptions where we had almost 5 million Texans without power at any given time during that blackout. Uh -huh. um, it, it was a really traumatic event for our state. Um, and it's interesting to me that we've, we've moved on in so many ways um, when that was, that was a horrible week. It, um, it really and was. one of the points I remember, you know, and this was when the power was starting to come back on, but the water was still out mm -hmm. for so many people was being like, y'all, it's warming up. That means the snow's melting and people don't have snow to boil for water anymore. Mm -hmm. And somebody just being like from out of state, like, oh, wow, now I understand how bad it is in Texas. That mm -hmm. now y'all are worried the snow is melting because it's your water source. Mm -hmm. um, so we just saw these cascading infrastructure failures. And so after... After seeing that, you know, my staff and I went back to the drawing board, looked at this electric good legislation we were working on and went, what else is missing? What do we need for our communities to be safe and whole during emergencies um, and, and make sure that people don't suffer because we're not prepared? Uh, so and, and this is what we came up with. And we, we saw the electric system failures. We saw the water system failures, but we also saw these ensuing healthcare failures. Uh -huh. um, the low point for me was seeing St. David's Hospital in South Austin being evacuated um, and what that meant. Um, and then one of the reasons the hospitals were struggling 
uh, is because facilities like nursing homes were evacuated um, and because dialysis centers closed their doors. And so a lot of the kidney patients were having to go directly to the hospital, um, further straining hospital resources at a time when a lot of their staff couldn't even get there. Um, and we, and many we hospitals don't have dialysis patients. units at the hospital. They, many hospitals do not have a way to dialyze uh, even one person, let alone uh, a horde of people coming in looking for dialysis treatment. Yeah, and especially not when they're having their own water and power struggles. Uh -huh. um, so we, we saw hospitals struggling to deal with patients that were in much worse shape than they should have been because of the lack of access to dialysis. Uh -huh. um, and so this legislation really was designed to try and address those issues and make sure that in any emergency situation in Texas, we can keep those core utilities running to the extent possible and we can keep our critical health care facilities open um, and able to serve Texas patients. Um, can you explain a little bit about what actually happened when uh, we saw the, the uh, pressure per square inch loss in terms of the water and uh, with the, the power grid. How is our power grid made up? It's like five different areas, right? Yeah. Um, I know, like, it's a, <laughs> like, oh Lord. <laughs> nice, nice short question uh, with a very neat, precise answer. No, it's, <laughs> I mean, I think what, what is, what was so complicated about the blackout is the number of different systems we saw fail mm -hmm. and our systems are interconnected and we have to treat them as such. Um, so the, the initial, the first domino definitely had to do with weather. Mm -hmm. Now we have some questions about whether that first domino happened on the natural gas side mm -hmm. of our utility systems, whether we had issues with enough natural gas flowing in the pipes to facilities, um, or whether that first domino happened at the actual electrical generation sites. Now those two systems are really dependent on each other. So the more power we lost, the more natural gas we lost, the more natural gas we lost, the more power we lost. And that kind mm -hmm. of spiraled downward together. Um, and the way our grid works, it has to be at a consistent frequency. Um, I believe it is 60 Hertz. So I haven't looked at a grid or at a graphic about it in a while. So apologies if I have my number off, but if I remember correctly, it's 60 Hertz. And if there isn't enough power going onto the grid and more people are taking power out than power is going on, mm -hmm. um, then the frequency of the grid drops. And when the frequency of the grid starts to drop, we start to lose whole lines. We start to lose power generation facilities. Mm -hmm. That grid only works if we keep it right at 60 Hertz, not above, not below. Um, and so because of that drop in frequency, that was when ERCOT, the Electrical Reliability Council of Texas started to order our electric providers around the state to you know, quote unquote shed load. And that means mm -hmm. turn off power to specific circuits so that we have, so that that equation, the amount of power generated, the amount of power used are equal. Um, and so that, that was sort of the point that people like you and me became aware of what was going on. Um, there is one more factor in that equation I want to mention, which is, um, you know, it, it's a softer inciting incident, but our homes and our businesses aren't weatherized enough. Um, if we had more weatherized homes, it would have reduced the energy demand. Uh, because some of why the energy demand was so high is because we were trying to heat our homes up 50 degrees above the outside air temperature, which is not something our houses are built for in Texas. Mm -hmm. They're just not, because it's not a situation we're used to being in, especially for multiple days in a row. Um, so the power went down and there were all these ideas of rolling blackouts. Uh, I think most of us know the blackouts did not roll oh. <laughs> particularly well. Uh, it was mostly if you were out, you were out. Right. Uh, we had some major communication failures with letting people know that was the case. Um, and my understanding is we probably should have known by pretty early that um, Monday morning, it was Monday the 15th that we woke up to the situation. We should have known pretty early Monday morning that we weren't getting a whole lot of power back that day. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so that, we, that was something that should have should be conveyed. Uh, you know, what I liked about what I like about House Bill uh, 2275 is that, uh, you know, and for Texas Kidney Foundation, we we uh, signed on once you put the the kidney population in there, because that that particular population, mm -hmm. there are seven hundred and and fifty eight uh, dialysis units in the state of Texas. 
the estimations are, and we still don't have full data on this, the estimations are that over 50% of them were inoperable during that time, at some point during that time. That's uh, very frightening because dialysis is something that you have to have three to four times a week. It's, it's a process by which all of the blood is taken out of the body, cleansed, and then put back in, into the body. And, it's, and people have to have it done because, of, uh, because they are in renal failure. Their kidneys are not functioning. So uh, we have 57,000 people in the state of Texas. The largest kidney population in the United States is right here in, in uh, this state. 10% of, of the uh, chronic kidney disease population is here in the state of Texas. And so when you, when you added us <laughs> and, and recognized us as a vulnerable population, of course we signed on at that point. Um, not that we didn't believe that the other, uh, that the rest of the world was, was going through something difficult. We know that that population really uh, was p facing, was steps away from catastrophe at that point. And, um, you know, I have to say hats off to you for, for uh, going back, amending the bill, and uh, really going for what is right for kidney patients in this state. Um, you're listening to On the Record yeah. with Tiffany, and we have to take a little break to pay the bills, but we will be right back with uh, my new favorite representative, <laughs> Aaron <laughs> Sweener. <laughs> And we're going to hear more about the bipartisan bill that she passed uh, as a sophomore. Uh, um, I would not say naive, a very well-informed sophomore who understands what the political process and just ha decided to take on uh, a Herculean subject and break it up into pieces and use some Texas ingenuity to make it work. And she's doing that. Um, we'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, we got another 12. See, it was that went by so fast. It goes by yeah, so fast. Yeah, I was at already like, 12 minutes. You're like, whoa, that didn't didn't feel probably like. Cause I, yeah, probably because I can lecture for 30 minutes about the steps of the blackout. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the blackout was just, uh, it was an overwhelming experience. We were getting calls. And, and what was weird was like, oh, I'll say it on, on camera. Okay, you, you want to count us down? And we're back with Aaron Sweener, representative uh, uh, for District 45, who um, just passed with 108 uh, affirmations, the House, House Bill 2275, and now we're on to the Senate, and we need you, my dear listeners, <laughs> to write your senators and to ask, to ask for this bill to be passed because uh, it is going to be a very important. It's a critical in infrastructure bill, and it's important to your well-being uh, as we move forward because you never know when a, when a disaster is going to happen. What we can tell you is that inevitably it will happen, and we want to be prepared. We're all about being prepared, that Texas ingenuity that makes us say, we're, we're going to look at the problem, fix it, and get ourselves ready for, for what, what comes ahead. Um, so, Representative Sweener, tell me, uh, can you tell our listeners about the, the differences in today's power needs? Because, you know, some of that is it, you know, Texas is being, we got a lot of people moving to Texas because it's a great place to live. Uh, but what does that mean for us with, with uh, critical infrastructure? Yeah, it, it means our needs go up year after year because there's more people living here. Um, and we've got some opportunities to address that. We can try to be more efficient in our use of electricity. Um, we, we can also, um, try to diversify our energy production sources. Um, most of the generation we lost was natural gas. Mm -hmm. Um, and so having, 
and, and I should say there were failures across all types of electric generation, uh, but the more diverse our energy portfolio is, the more resilient we are to something going wrong. Um, and we need to prepare to be more resilient uh, because while we all hope that winter storm Yuri was uh, a very rare, hopefully once in a lifetime event down here in Texas, um, our climate just isn't as predictable as it used to be. Um, you know, climate change has been ongoing. It results mm -hmm. in, you know, as some people say weird weather. Um, there's actually a scientist who was recently at Texas Tech University, Catherine Hayhoe, but now she's moved on to work for the Nature Conservancy who doesn't call it global warming, she calls it global weirding. Um, <laughs> and so while, while we look at a winter storm and go, well, that's not part of climate change, there actually is a theory that scientists are working on that does predict exactly the type of event we saw. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is we're gonna have to be prepared for hotter summers, colder winters, more, mm -hmm. Um, hurricane events, all of those are things that can be predicted under climate change. Um, and so we have to be ready to need a whole bunch more AC than we're used to, or a whole bunch more heat than we're used to. Um, and, and that's going to be one of our big challenges moving forward. And it, you know, you mentioned the challenge it places on the power side, but it also places a big challenge on the water side as well. Um, and making sure that we have sustainable sources of both available for Texans. And we both have to look at the supply side and then we also have to look at the demand side. Um, this legislation helps a lot on the demand side and making sure that folks are, are ready, um, uh, ready if there are power reductions to prioritize the most vulnerable. Um, and then also on the water side, it protects both the supply and demand sides. The pressure per square inch like for dialysis <laughs> patients, that's uh, imperative. They can't, the dialysis units, even if they had power, if there's no pressure per square inch uh, for water, it takes 37 uh, um, gallons of water, 37 to 49 gallons of water to dialyze a patient. So if you don't have pressure per square inch, they, it, it can't be done. And if you don't have potted water, it, it can't be done. Um, so your legislation really uh, would make makes a big difference for that particular uh, demographic. And also it, it makes a big difference for uh, people with respiratory problems. And you know, the many folks who, who need devices uh, to to maintain quality of life, uh, this legislation deals with that. Can you tell people a little bit about uh, what the legislation does in terms of uh, the generators that it would produce? And uh, yeah, you the, can't just go to Home Depot and get the generators that we need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the legislation fundamentally provides a pot of grant money and it mm -hmm. provides it in a few different areas. One is for the electric utilities, another is for the water utilities. Uh, and wastewater, I should say. And, and you mm -hmm. keep mentioning water pressure. So many yes. of the water failures we saw were fundamentally about water pressure yes. being lost for whatever reason. And once you lose that water pressure, it takes a long time to get it back up and running. Um, and whenever you lose water pressure, that's when you're at risk of some type of bacteria invading the system um, or some other type of water source getting into your drinking water and contaminating the system, which is part of why it's so important to keep water pressure up. It also keeps the water supply clean. Um, and so that's why, you know, we pretty much all ended up under um, boil water notices is because mm -hmm. at some point our water systems lost pressure and after they were repressurized, they had to be tested. Um, and luckily most of them were clean and we could go on drinking them within a day or two. Um, the, I apologize, I lost the next part. Oh, on the generation side, I'm sorry. Um, on, on the generation side, um, it would fund backup generation for hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living centers, and dialysis centers. Um, and, and as you mentioned, Tiffany, that was not included in the original version of the bill. Neither, mm -hmm. um, only hospitals were included. Um, and a big part of that was folks had a lot of concerns about sending um, public money to private entities. Um, but more and more, we had this conversation with folks about what the needs really are in the community, where we saw the pinch points. And there was just no way it made sense to not include dialysis centers. That was one of the biggest pinch points we saw in the state for emergency services. Um, and, you know, one, one of my colleagues, Representative John Busey, you know, told us all a heartbreaking story about losing somebody, a neighbor on his street 
because he was a kidney patient and was unable to get care um, and ended up having his condition deteriorate enough during the blackout that he didn't make it. Um, so that, that was a real cause of loss of life. Um, so we, we don't prescribe where people can go to get the backup generation. Um, they would apply to Texas Department of Emergency Management with their need. Um, we do ask Texas Department of Emergency Management to make sure that every region of the state has dialysis centers with backup generation. So even if not every dialysis center in the state has backup generation, you know, there'd be adequate numbers to serve during an emergency situation in every population center. Um, and that's exactly what we, we need. Uh, I've, I've talked before about uh, Network 14. They're the crisis management um, team for the, the state of Texas. They, they really uh, do all the crisis management for dialysis. Um, and they were being inundated with calls from patients uh, and caregivers and uh, providers alike because it was just, uh, it was unprecedented. Nothing like that had ever happened before. And much of it, if, if we would have coordinated better, it, it would have been easier. Not that the situation would have been easier, but it, it certainly would have been better in terms of communication with the patients because they were, they were, many were frightened at what they were seeing. So uh, I was happy when you, when you included us on this bill. I, I was, you know, just sitting on pins and needles waiting for it. <laughs> and then when um, the fact that, the, that you took on this legislative uh, feat because this is, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, money is scarce. And to ask for $2 billion is a lot of money. But it is money that we desperately need to fix a problem that, uh, frankly, should have been taken care of uh, over the last couple of decades instead of just, uh, in, instead of us, us going through a, um, a difficult moment and finally getting it together, <laughs> you know? We, we learned the hard way we have to invest in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We learned the hard way. And, and I've had some folks be like, well, why should we spend this money on this? Isn't this their responsibility? Or isn't this this person's responsibility? But no, it is the state's responsibility to invest in infrastructure, full mm -hmm. stop. And we're behind. We were caught flat footed in the storm because we haven't been consistently making these investments mm -hmm. over the years. Um, and we are talking about a lot of money. Um, you know, the final number wouldn't be decided by the bill. It would be decided by the appropriations committee. Um, but it's, it's a lot of money that would go somewhere productive. And we have a real tremendous opportunity right now because the American Rescue Plan passed at the federal level. And it contains $16.7 billion of money that we have a lot of discretion about how to spend here in the state. Mm -hmm. And so I, to me, some of the best bang for our buck is to spend it on infrastructure. It's a one-time investment, so it's fiscally responsible. It doesn't create an ongoing need to keep funding a program. Mm -hmm. um, and it would go to a purpose that literally will save Texan lives in future emergencies, as well as make our system more efficient and effective overall. And we are always, in Texas, the phrase fiscally responsible is, is if it's not a mantra, it definitely should be because <laughs> it's how we all live our lives and how we think down here. Uh, so uh, when I look look at at uh, this investment, uh, it's an investment in Texas. It's an investment in in the quality of life. It's an investment in saving lives, uh, and it's something that is worth us talking about and hashing out because uh, we don't want to see one person die. Uh, from from uh, a, a system that that can be reinforced and turned into something much better than what it is today. Um, and you're listening to On the Record with Tiffany, and we're going to come back and talk a little bit more with uh, our favorite representative from District 45, and.
talk and figure out what's going on with our power system and how we can fix it. This, once again, Texas ingenuity at its best. Yay! I always say that about Texas ingenuity because it is. We are an industrious little group down here. No. You know, where do you live, Tiffany? Where are you? I'm in San Antonio. In San I'm in okay. San Antonio. So, so kidney disease is the worst from San Antonio on I'm down sorry. in terms of right along the border and everything. So, uh, in terms of the nation, <laughs> it fluctuates. The two worst places fluctuate between our border on uh, um, of Mexico and then the the California border for okay. Mexico. So it's those are the two worst places for kidney disease in the country. Um, and I presume is that tied to pretty high rates of diabetes? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. it's tied to diabetes. And so uh, I've lost nine family members to kidney disease. So I'm I'm I took this job trying to uh, figure out what happened to them. And I thought there was a genetic link, and there is a genetic link. Right when you uh, came out with the bill. Uh, I, this is so odd. Like that, this just shows you how God works. I, uh, the first big paper on AP oil one, which is the the first genetic link to uh, descendants of West Sub-Saharan Africa, came out on the 14th, and I'm one of the, the authors on that paper. So I was just like, wow. "This is a good day, <laughs> a bill on a paper." <laughs> But, well, congratulations on the paper. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, you want to count us down? Well, we are back with Representative Erin Sweener. Um, she is with uh, District 45 and has is a sophomore member of the of the House. I, I I'm just you know I always think that uh, youth springs eternal you know you you're always <laughs> thinking uh in a different way from the establishment and we we need that right now we definitely needed somebody who's willing to kind of take on the difficulty of this subject because it's just so it can be overwhelming and daunting when you're looking at something as as great as the power grid it's the power grid so everybody's going to be like oh how can we fix this you know, but you're, you're legisl you're one piece at a time. That's right. You you <laughs> just have to take a problem and dissect it and and go, go at it one little bit at a time until you get until you get everything done. Um, you mentioned weatherizing because that was a big topic during uh, during and after the storm is the fact that we had. Uh, unweatherized uh, uh, power sources. Why was that? Um, a lot of it was optimism. A lot of it was folks assuming it would never get down into the teens for multiple days in a row. And so I don't want to say we had unweatherized power sources. We had inadequately weatherized inadequately power, weatherized sources. power sources. And, you know, I'm, I'm a little biased here, but I spent seven years in Montana and the power never went off because it was cold. Mm -hmm. You know, occasionally, occasionally the power went out because a whole bunch of snow fell on the power line and broke it. And we had some of that happen. Um, my district got hit very hard with just ice on the lines mm -hmm. and had a lot of physical damage. But this is this was different. This was we had systems um, that had sensors that weren't adequately weatherized to withstand the temperatures, and we had whole giant power plants go down because of one sensor freezing. Mm -hmm. um, we had natural gas lines um, that just didn't have enough fuel in them to run uh, the power plants. Um, and who, aren't we one of the largest producers of natural gas? We are, but a lot of folks shut down their wells to try and reduce the risk of them freezing over. Some people did have their wells freeze over. Um, and then the outstanding question is how much just speculation we had because natural gas prices went through the roof. Mm -hmm. Our natural gas market is pretty much entirely unregulated. Mm -hmm. um, so folks potentially have a lot of money to make. And that's a bill for another day. No. <laughs> there's, there's a federal um, trade manipulation investigation going on that mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing the results from uh, because it's very possible that we had folks 
just redirect their natural gas elsewhere or sit on it until the price went a little higher. Um, and um, we had some facilities that just had severe ice damage. I mean, we, we had one facility that just had ice fall on it from another nearby facility and do physical damage. I mean, the number of reasons facilities went down varied a lot, but primarily were due to weather. Um, and then when we had that frequency drop happen on the grid, more facilities went down because of that as well. Um, and, you know, I just talked about thermal type facilities, um, but we also, you know, had windmills that stopped turning, you know, they, their systems were set to stop turning at a certain low temperature to prevent damage uh, because they weren't winterized adequately for the temperatures ahead. Um, we are hopefully going to pass Senate Bill 3 through the Texas House soon. It already passed through the Senate. And one of the things Senate Bill 3 will require is for every type of generation facility to undergo winterization, um, which is absolutely necessary. And it also requires the um, natural gas systems to do winterization as well, because you can't run a natural gas power plant if you don't have any natural gas in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that would be difficult. <laughs> But we had, you know, we had coal facilities stop working because of sensor issues. We had a nuclear facility in South, South Texas stop working because of an issue with a sensor. Um, so some of this is very discreet and treatable, um, mm -hmm. but we do need to make sure we're prepared for any eventuality. And I think that's where my legislation comes in. It's about making that local grid more resilient, making that local water system more resilient and making sure our medical facilities have what they need on site to stay open. That's right. Because, you know, Texas, uh, a lot of the, the headlines and what we saw uh, people reporting on and talking about is, is the Texas, the, the actual infrastructure in Texas and the power grid itself. The fact that we are our own little island, if you will, uh, in terms of power. Um, and I, I believe, believe in, in how we do things and what our, our system is. I have no problem with, with uh, us being independent. I'm pretty independent and feisty. I think, they, I think that is a, a part of being a Texan. But uh, I also believe that, that if you're going to be an island unto yourself, you better be able to take care of every person on that island. And, um, you know, HB 2275, is the first step in us us getting there to take care of everybody on the island, um, because I saw the same thing that you you did. You know, you said you lived in Montana. This wasn't an unprecedented winter storm for the rest of the world. If we would have been properly weatherized, this is like a a, a tough Maryland day. You know, for <laughs> I mean, people in Maryland are like, what's going on down there? <laughs> You know, <laughs> well, and, and I think that's the thing is I, I really resist people being like, oh, the winter storm Yuri crisis. And I'm like, it wasn't the storm that got us. It was that our infrastructure wasn't ready yes, for it. Exactly. That's what got us. We, we so had let's, infrastructure let's, human caused failure, not a weather disaster. That's that's right. Let's name it what it is, because uh, at some point we, we you cannot abdicate responsibility for everything. Now, now that was a, the issue that I had when I sat on the meeting and listened, listened to uh, leadership members who are now, now gone from uh, ERICOT commenting so um, almost flippantly about what, what had occurred. You know, uh, you can't be removed from a situation. Yeah. And, and and removed in terms of your your human emotion and connection to what is right and what is wrong, uh, and throwing out all of these little hand grenades like oh no it's it, it didn't have anything to do with decision making here no yes it did <laughs> it did I, I have been known to say it wasn't anybody's fault it was everybody's fault yeah because I mean I I do think there was a little bit of a I'll say a, a witch hunt going on at the beginning for sort of who can be the scapegoat, who can mm -hmm. we blame? But the truth is there was no one person. This was a series of really big mistakes made yeah. at lots of levels. I'll take my share of the blame and since I did of different one systems. session in the Texas house and didn't fix it. But, <laughs> but there, are, um, there were lots of different systems here that failed. So that meant lots of different places that we need to 
sit down and communicate across. <laughs> We've got to communicate. Like the, the water and the power have to communicate. The power, water, and uh, the, the crisis management teams at, at uh, facilities, hospitals, and, and uh, crisis management in general for, for uh, underserved populations have to be able to communicate. You can't, uh, you can't help people if you're not actually talking to the people that help people. <laughs> <laughs> that is accurate. I, I was laughing because, you know, I spent a lot of time with my electrical provider during the blackout saying, why aren't y'all telling everybody that the power is not coming back? Because mm -hmm. I'm like, people who are in a dangerous situation, somebody who needs an oxygen tank charge, somebody who needs to, who, who and just- they're, And they're waiting old, because they, they think they know. believe you. <laughs> yeah, they need to know the power isn't coming back tonight. So if mm -hmm. they need to drive somewhere, they can do it before it's dark and the roads get icier again. You know, like mm -hmm. I- and I was pushing back and they finally told me the reason they hadn't sent a mass communication to their members that it wasn't getting better for any other two days um, was because they were using an old email system that takes two days to email everybody in their system. It literally takes that right there. two days. And, and I mean, and I should say this particular bill doesn't necessarily address that, but we've but there's been other legislation and we actually have a writer in the budget to do this audit of local communications um, to make sure that we do have the capacity we need and that people do have best practices and have the tools they need to talk to somebody in an emergency situation. You know, Tiffany, can I tell you a little bit about smart metering? Sure. So one of the things in this bill that um, it can fund for our electric grid is what is, what is called advanced meter technology, better known in the public as smart meters. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful thing about smart meters is if we don't have enough power, they make it much easier to roll different areas and different households. You know, I think a lot of folks experience this idea that they were being rolled, but then the circuits weren't functioning enough. And so the electric companies just for pure practical reasons had to leave certain areas off and certain areas on. And they wouldn't turn certain areas off because they were on the same circuit as something that was critical infrastructure, like a fire station or a hospital. The great thing about smart meters is it gets it down to the individual building and sometimes even inside the building. So you could go to an HEB and you could turn off everything but the freezers that the food are stored in and save power that way for the rest of the grid. Or you could go, hey, this particular building, I can't, or this house, I can't turn it off because there's someone in there who relies on oxygen tanks and they need power. So I can turn every other house on the street off for a few hours and leave their house on. It lets them do this very targeted level, um, this very targeted level turn off of power if necessary. Um, and also lets them go into a house and say, if, if somebody has agreed to it, I should say, um, and turn the thermostat down a few degrees if it's cold so that they can save power across the system and avoid having to turn people off. It's really great technology that makes us a lot more responsive, can make us more energy efficient, protect the most vulnerable mm -hmm. and minimize the impact of any type of power failure in the future. And this bill uh, addresses smart meters. This legislation would fund places smart like meters. our electric co-ops and our municipal electric providers going out and putting those um, on more on more systems, more households. And you're listening to On the Record with Tiffany, and we're changing the world with Aaron Sweener and House Bill 2275. And we're going to come back and talk about what you can do to get this bill passed in the Senate and get the funding and the changes that we need made to our power grid, hospitals, nursing homes, and dialysis units, the most vulnerable populations, and you taken care of. And you're listening to On the Record with Tiffany. Okay. Thank you for letting me go on about smart this, Huh? <laughs> Thank you for letting me go on about smart meters. Oh, no, no. I want to talk about that some more because smart meters, I mean, all the people that are being dialyzed at home, that are doing at-home uh, dialysis, uh, not they would let dialysis. them sign up on a list and say you can't turn me off because I depend on medical equipment, mm -hmm. and it would make it easy for the electric provider to actually honor that. I mean, obviously, sometimes lines go down, and that's a whole other can of worms. But 
it would allow them to say, hey, you can't roll my house. I'm vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I require electricity to live. And you talk know? about talk about making a difference for those those patients. I mean, uh, you want to count us down? Is this our last segment? Yes. This is our last segment. See, that Let's was my really sure we talk about the Senate. Yes, we have to talk about the Senate and uh, and the smart meters, but we want to spend most of our time on this on the Senate and what they need to do there, who they need to contact, and uh, we can put that on our on our website. Two. And we're back with Aaron Sweener. Uh, and we're talking about House Bill 2275 and all of the, the um, improvements this bill would allow us to make to critical infrastructure, which is what failed us during the uh, winter storm, Uri. Um, Representative Sweener, just in our last segment, we were talking about smart meters and what that means for our constituency. So let me make sure I understand this properly. Smart meters allow the electrical companies to leave the power on in a rolling uh, blackout um, or brownout, <laughs> leave the power on at a specific house. So say you are a dialysis patient, you are, you receive, uh, you use, um, dialysis at home and you are getting your dialysis on your next gen dialysis machine and you're trying to, uh, live. They can turn off, they can leave your power on during, yes. during a rolling blackout. No, what, what it would let them do is instead of looking by neighborhood or by circuit, it would make it down to the individual meter, whether that's a home or a business. Um, you know, I know there were all these conversations about the downtowns of cities being lit up mm -hmm. and um, the, the electric companies having no way to get down there and turn off those big buildings without also turning off a hospital or a fire station or whatnot. Mm -hmm. This would allow them to go meter by meter and turn off those non-critical uses while protecting those more critical uses, like an individual who re relies on medical equipment or a dialysis center um, or a nursing home. It makes it easier for them to target. And then in addition, it also lets them do some energy conservation mechanisms before they reach the point of having to roll anybody. Now, w when uh, when we saw the, the smart meter, uh, option like literally that was a dancing in the office kind of experience because uh the home dialysis patients were so concerning uh for for everyone because they didn't have a dialysis chair what do you do how do you <laughs> if you if they don't have power if they don't have pressure per square inch uh, in terms of water, um, w what are we supposed to do? What, how do we, how do you treat that person? So that, you know, I love that. Now, how would that work? Would, how do they, how would they sign up? Has anybody thought through the logistics of it? Um, most, well, all electric providers are currently required to have a process for um, critical infrastructure facilities to sign up. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a process that wasn't used very well prior to the blackout, but I'm optimistic it will be used better in the future. Um, and I also think a lot of electric providers are trying to identify where they have folks who um, depend on medical equipment to live and trying to identify those households because they certainly got those calls during the blackout. Uh, but the bill as written does not formalize that process. Um, but I think we would see our utilities adopted quickly. And that sounds like something that we need to uh, to to have groups like Network 14 working with uh, working with with hospitals and and facilities on this uh, because they would 
like in terms of uh, with the kidney population, they would be the ones who would know where or who could be a one-stop shop for, for figuring out where, where people are. You know, where the, most people have a, a nephrologist or a, a, a dialysis um, check-in that they're, that's monitoring them when they're doing their, their uh, in-home dialyzing. So there, there are some, some groups that, that, uh, that can be helpful in that sense. Um, let's talk about what citizens who are listening can do in order for, for them to join in. You guys, you have agency. You have the right. That, that's what being a, a voter and a Texan is all about. You have the right to say, hey, we don't ever want to see this happen again. And if you don't ever want to see something, uh, a, a major infrastructure failure, uh, then we have to do something now. And that Absolutely. something is House Bill 2275. It's the first step towards it. Now that it has passed the House, and, and we are ecstatic about that, we need it to pass the Senate. So, Representative Sweener, if we want this to pass the Senate, we need to contact our senators. Absolutely. Call email your state senator and ask them when they are going to vote out 2275. Mm -hmm. That is that is the answer. And it's always best to contact the person who represents you. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if you have a friend who lives in a different district, encourage them to make a phone call too. Um, the more people who contact their elected officials, the better. Um, Let's and the other a bipartisan is, movement, you all. It is. And contact our officials. You know, we... The, the beautiful thing about our state is that we have people from every uh, background, every walk of life. This is a very diverse state, uh, but we come together when uh, the chips are down. That is a that is 100% Texan right there to to figure out what the problem is, identify it, and then begin to make a pathway with solutions for that problem. That's what House Bill 2275 is. 2275 is the solution to inf critical infrastructure failures. And it is, it, is a, it is looking forward, not simply reacting to a problem, but dealing with the problem at hand and preparing for the next uh, powerful storm or whatever manner this comes in because there's, there, we will have another uh, hundred we, year whatever. <laughs> we will have another power failure and we talk yeah. a lot about weather but another danger quite frankly is cyber terrorism mm -hmm. as well interrupting our grid. I mean there's the number of things that can go wrong is infinite. But yeah. the way we can prepare our discreet and real and help regardless of what type of crisis we the, experience. So this bill is making about making sure that Texans aren't caught unprepared again. And you need to contact your senator. And Absolutely. And, yes. you know, folks, I think, always assume their voice doesn't matter. Y'all, if senators get an email, state senators get an email on the same subject from 20 different people, that makes a big splash. It does. 20 people. It does. Makes a big splash. Yeah, so you are as important as anyone else in this state. And if you if you want to make a difference, you can. You can take agency. You can reach out address your senator. You don't have to be the most articulate person in the world. You simply have to say, we do not ever want to experience what we experienced during Winter Storm Uri. We don't ever want to experience power going out in such a helter-skelter manner where we don't know what's going to happen next. We want to be prepared. And that is a normal uh, human reaction, is 
we want to be prepared. We've got the infra we've got the critical in infrastructure bill. We are we have thought through what being prepared looks like, and all you have to do is help us bring it home by contacting your center, email them, call them, and let them know this is important to you. And you don't care if we are thawed out, you're gonna raise heaven until we get this done. I couldn't say it better, Tiffany. You know, that, so maybe we'll make that a Jeopardy question next time. No. <laughs> <laughs> What is raise heaven? <laughs> I also like your description of the power going out in a helter skelter way. That feels like <laughs> as good a way to describe it as anything. It was a mess. It was. It was. It was what uh, my grandmother would call a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> she was. Uh, she was. She was really funny, but. Uh, she believed in calling things like they are and just saying, okay, now what are we going to do? Like, you have to just look at a problem. You can't excoriate everyone for, for being at fault. Uh, you know, I, I despise the fact that we're always finger pointing at other people instead of, I, I don't mind pointing a finger at somebody who's doing something right. Yes, Representative Erin Sweener is changing the world with her, her uh, legislative push. For House Bill 2275, I mean, who who would have thought that a sophomore would author something that is so profound and will affect so many Texans, especially if it's funded properly, and it will be. Well, don't worry, well, we'll be fighting for thing, it. Yeah, I think the good thing about being a new member is nobody's told you you can't yet. That's right. And see, so I think try. that too. Nobody's told you you don't believe you can't. Because I'm sure there's there's people that will tell you that you you can't. But what I like about you, Representative Sweener, is that you don't believe it. You believe that you can, and that is exactly what we need. That is 100% uh, what this state and this country needs. So thank you for your service to the underserved and for continuing to remember the people that that uh, elected you and the people that didn't, serving all of us, regardless of, of whether or not you got a vote, is not based on, you, you don't do your job based on your base. You do your job <laughs> based on what's right for the people that, that uh, live in your state. So well, thank you. And thank you for all of your tireless advocacy and the advocacy of the Texas Kidney Foundation for standing up for the thousands of patients here in Texas that need someone to have their back. Thank you so much. And we will continue to do that. And, and we will be championing this in the uh, Senate and uh, advocating for, for uh, kidney patients. So thank you for being here with us on On the Record with Tiffany. Uh, it's been another great, great uh, episode with with uh, Representative Sweener on 9.30 a.m. The Answer, where we talk to people from every walk of life to prove that we're more alike than we are different. And, and when it comes down to, to uh, the subject of power and, and uh, crises, Texans come together and come up with the best answers. Thank you again. Have a great day.